Today we're going to go over sympathy, which is our final poem in this unit, our unit that encompasses beauty, pride, and power. So let's get started. Um, you've already read the poem and you've already heard a student analysis, so I'm just going to give you a few more details about it, a little bit of background on Paul Lawrence Dunbar, and just a few things that I want you to know about the poem. Remember that there are guided notes attached on Google Classroom, and if you do get a chance to fill out those Google Notes, you do have those notes when you take a quiz, and you will have a quiz on all three of these poems that we read. Um, there, there's uh, Barter, there's Ozymandias, and then there's sympathy. So if you have all of those notes, you're, you're sure to get a great grade for that, that Socrative quiz. Okay, so Sympathy by, by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. This is a quote that I really like from the poem. I know what the caged bird feels, alas. And I just have that on there because I'm really, really, I really like this particular quote from it because it tells you exactly how Paul Lawrence Dunbar feels about the caged bird. He feels sorry for the caged bird and he sympathizes with the caged bird that alas tells us that. All right, here's a picture of Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Um, if you're doing the notes, you have a place to write some of this stuff in. He was born in the late 19th century in 1872 in Dayton, Ohio. Died February 9th, 1906, also Dayton, Ohio. Now, slavery was not prevalent at the point in time that, that Dunbar was writing his poetry. It had been abolished by his birth, but it was still very recent history. And in fact, both of his parents had been slaves in Kentucky. And so it was very close to Dunbar, and he really understood the idea of slavery. His study and his work opportunities were limited, severely limited, due to his lack of finances and the still prevalent idea of racism and racial discrimination, discrimination coming on the heels of slavery. He was interested from, in writing from a very young age, and he did find success in the writing world. Um, one thing that he did do, with, which was pretty distinct and pretty important, was there was a 1903 musical, and it was the first African-American, all African-American musical that appeared on Broadway. And he was instrumental in some of those song lyrics that happened in that musical. And um, the musical itself was called In Dahomey. And if you get a chance to look at YouTube and some of the songs, some of the songs are very cool. They're kind of jazzy and um, you can kind of get an idea of what that was all about. This is Paul Lawrence Dunbar's wife. They were quite the couple during their time period. They're very important people as far as in the writing world. She was named Alice Dunbar Nelson. And those are her dates up there, July 19th, 1875, September 18th, 1935. She was also an American poet, and it was through his admiration of her poetry and her writing that they actually met. She was also a journalist and a political activist, which couldn't have been easy during that time period. She was among the first of the generations to be born free in the South after the Civil War, and she was a really prominent African-American that was involved in poetry and writing in the whole artistic flourishing of the Harlem Renaissance era. In 1900, uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar was diagnosed with tuberculosis, which we commonly know as TB. And you see a picture of the two of them as a couple right there boarding a train. Now, tuberculosis during that time period was often fatal. And strangely enough, and I don't know if this was a normal diagnosis or not, but his doctors recommend he started drinking whiskey to alleviate his symptoms and to kind of alleviate the pain that he was suffering. They also advised him, and this was pretty traditional, they advised him to move to Colorado with his wife because there was something about that cold, dry mountain air. And in some places like on the prairies and things like that, that that air was better. It didn't have the dampness that affected the tuberculosis patient or people who had trouble breathing. So he did move there. Now, his drinking, the whiskey, he was prescribed it, so he drank a lot and he continued to drink. And he didn't just drink just to alleviate his symptoms because he really became a problem drinker. And he and his wife separated in 1902. They loved each other very much, though, and she never divorced him. They never divorced. But his depression, his declining health, his addiction to alcohol, his dependence on that, all of those things kind of further damaged his health, and he really suffered from that. 
Now, he went back to Dayton, Ohio in 1904 to be to live with his mother again. And there were some issues between Dunbar's mother and Dunbar's wife. There was some, I don't know, some issues. I guess that happens sometimes with mother-in-laws. But there were some issues there. But he moved back to live with his mother. And he died in 1906 of tuberculosis. He was only 33 years old. And his wife happened to find out, even though they were in contact, they hadn't been in recent contact. It wasn't as easy back then to maintain contact. And she didn't find out he died until somebody, well, until she read it in a newspaper. No one let her know. So let's look at the title of the poem. The title of the poem is called Sympathy. So what does that mean? And that's a quiz question, by the way. Sympathy means that you have feelings of pity or sorrow when you look at someone else and you understand their situation, you understand what they're going through. So you feel sorry for them. It is also an understanding between people or a common feeling, like we're both feeling the same thing. So we have a sympathy together. So in this poem, the sympathy that is represented is the poet talking about the caged bird and how the poet feels sorry for this caged bird. This is the poem itself. I'm going to read it really quickly. And I know you've had it read before a couple of times, but I'm going to read it one more time. So sympathy. I know what the caged bird feels, alas, when the sun is bright on the upland slopes, when the wind stirs soft through the springing grass and the river flows like a stream of glass, when the first bird sings and the first bud opes and the faint perfume from its chalice steals, I know what the caged bird feels. I know why the caged bird beats its wings till its blood is red on the cruel bars, for he must fly back to his perch and cling when he fain would be on the bough a swing, and a pain still throbs in the old, old scars, and they pulse again with a keener sting. I know why he beats his wings. I know why the caged bird sings, ah me, when his wing is bruised and his bosom sore, when he beats his bars and he would be free. It is not a carol of joy or glee, but a prayer that he sends from his heart's deep core, but a plea that upward to heaven he flings, I know why the caged bird sings. And we see a couple different things in that. We see how Dunbar is telling us that he understands this bird, this bird in the cage that is, that is looking out over freedom, but he's in a cage and he can't get out. Okay, so taking a look at this in a closer way, we understand that this was published in 1899. And on the surface, it seems to be about this bird in a cage that can't get out and wants out and wants to be free and wants out of that cage. And that is in fact what it means on the surface level. But on a deeper level, it is about the condition of oppressed people, of people who are put in cages and can't escape for those cages, even if they're metaphorical, that they can't be completely free. At the time of this publication, black people were still oppressed and experiencing a lot of hatred and a lot of disadvantage. They had, um, you know, they're the discrimination of slavery had really just barely passed away and, and a lot of people still had remnants of those feelings. And Dunbar's own experiences of, of racial inequality and of people having this prejudice against him, as well as the fact that his parents were just once removed from slaves. I mean, his parents had been slaves in Kentucky, means that he would have been really, really in sympathy and really attuned to the problems of someone who's oppressed, the problems of someone who is in fact metaphorically caged like a bird. Now this poem is divided into three stanzas and we've talked about stanzas before. A stanza is kind of this natural division and a lot of times it's by idea or by thought. And of course I call them a poem paragraph and we see usually there's a division like on the actual poem itself, we see like the line break there where we see it, you know, there's like a space in between. So we see the different stanzas there and each stanza kind of like ends with, I know why the caged bird sings or I know why he does this. Like that idea of I understand, I sympathize. The extended metaphor of this poem, an extended metaphor is kind of a poetic device. The extended metaphor the idea of a metaphor, of course, is a comparison of two things without using like or as, but the extended metaphor means it lasts for a while. Like there's one big long metaphor and it lasts through a series of lines or 
uh, throughout a paragraph or for several sentences in an essay. And here we see this extended metaphor of the bird and representing these oppressed, trapped people and how they really just long to be free and to not have to worry about the bars of their cage or the things that hold them back. So that is the extended metaphor here, that bird represents these people that just long for complete freedom and things not holding them back. We have an example of alliteration here in line three. We see it says, stirs soft through springing. Okay, that idea of alliteration is that similar sound, like that S sound that stirs soft springing. It's musical, it's rhythmic, and that is called alliteration. And it is something that poets use to kind of give it that lyrical quality, that song-like quality. We also have an example of a poetic device, a simile in line four, where it says, the river flows like a stream of glass. And of course, a simile, you've had similes many times before. A simile is a poetic device or is a literary device that compares two things that are not necessarily alike, but it does use the word like or as. So in this particular simile, the poet Dunbar is comparing the river and how it's flowing like this beautiful, smooth stream of glass, like it just looks like a glass-like surface. And that is a simile because it uses the word like. Now let's take a look at some examples of imagery here. We have lots of imagery in here. We have some scent imagery with the faint perfume. We have the, the beauty of the stream of glass and the birds singing and the first bud ope. That means the first buds of springtime opening up the flowers of springtime. We see the sun bright on the slopes and the mountains and the wind in the springtime grass. We see all of those beautiful images in that first stanza. When we go to the second stanza, however, we see a kind of a different imagery, still very powerful imagery, but very different in its intent. So we're seeing how this caged bird inside this cage sees these beautiful things, but can't get to them, can't be free and can't get to what it wants to get to. And it's like beating itself against these, this cage, against the wall of this cage until its wings and its breast is just turning red with the blood because it just keeps hitting the sides of the cage, trying to be free over and over and over. So it's a really cruel kind of horrible image that we see there. And then we see that the bird, after it's like beaten itself against the cage walls, has to fly back to the perch that it's given in a, in a cage. They have that little perch that hangs down from the top and it has to land on that perch where it would really rather be in the bow a swing and that means on the on the branches of the trees and free in those you know in that nature like scenario and it says he fain would be on the bow a swing and a pain still throbs in the old old scars so we know that this bird has been doing this been trying to be free for a long time and still has this pain from trying to get there and he just can't and they pulse again with a keener sting so it means that again and again this bird just keeps trying to like get to freedom and beating its wings against the cage and causing itself pain and causing itself to hurt because it's trying to strive for that freedom that that oppressed bird wants. And then we go on to the third stanzas and he's really making the connection here in this third stanza. I know why the cage bird sings, ah me, with his wings bruised and his bosom sore. When he beats his bars, he would be free. It is not a carol of joy or glee. So he's saying, I know that song. I understand that song. Even though it's cruel and it's horrible and it's awful inside that cage, he still sings because he wants to be free. It's not a carol, like a, like a Christmas carol, a carol of joy or celebration. It's not that. It's not a song of plea, but it's this prayer that this bird is sending up to heaven above that he wants to be free. He wants to be out of that cage. And the person that is oppressed sends those pleas up to heaven all of the time, that same song of wanting to be free and wanting to understand the world without restrictions or without limitations. that They're held in. So we see that that connection between the bird and the person who still has that restricted, oppressed feeling. Now the rhyme scheme in this poem is identified for you here. It's A, B, A, B, B, C, C. And if you look over at the right-hand side of the screen, I've identified where those are. 
And again, when we're doing rhyme scheme, we read the first line and we look at that first word, alas, and we label that first line with an A. And then we look at the second line and does that line rhyme with alas? It does not, so we give it B. When we look at the next one where it says grass, we understand it rhymes with alas, so we also give it an A. Okay, and so we see that alas, grass, and glass are all labeled with A. Now, when we have that second line, it doesn't rhyme with anything, we give it a B. So slopes rhymes with opes. Okay, and then we have in the, in the same stanza, we get down to the word steals, and it hasn't rhymed with anything, so we give it its own letter, the letter of C. And then the line below it, that feels rhymes with C, steals, so we get a, give it the letter C. So we've got that A, B, A, A, B, C, C rhyme scheme. And when we do that, when we label that, those rhyming, that rhyming at the end of words, we call that rhyme scheme. Okay, themes that we basically have in this, in this poem, there's kind of three really connected themes, but we could kind of look at it three different ways. We've got the oppression of, of people, of people who long to be free, long to be able to, to obtain what they want, to go forward and not be restricted. We see that prolonged, cruel or unjust treatment or that control over people. So oppression is one of our themes. We also have the theme of the human condition. So the human condition is all of the characteristics and key events that compose the essentials of human existence, including birth, growth, emotion, aspiration, conflict, and mortality. And we see this because the human condition in this poem are these people that born oppressed and born that they can't achieve the freedom and the emotional growth and they can't aspire to what they want to aspire to because they're being held back by this oppression theme. And then finally we have this captivity freedom theme which really relates back to the other two where we have this wishing for freedom, hating the confinement, hating the restriction and the bird is not free to do what it wants to do, what it wants to do naturally and on a deeper level Neither are the people that the extended metaphor represents, these people that are oppressed and held back. They're also in captivity in some way, in a metaphorical way. Okay, the last thing we're going to talk about with this poem, we have some kind of different um, words in here that you may or may not recognize. So I wanted to clarify those for you. And some of these will be on your vocab list. First, we have the word alas. And that alas we see in that first quote I gave you, that alas is an expression of grief, pity, or concern. So when we say alas, we automatically know that there is an expression of sympathy there, that we're feeling bad for someone. We're feeling the, a grief emotion, a concern, a sympathy emotion. Our second word is chalice. And chalice is kind of a fancy word for a big cup or goblet. Um, it's used a lot of times kind of to reference like, I don't know, like a medieval kind of idea, but it's usually used in drinking like some sort of sacred wine or some kind of sacred, you know, drink that they're presenting to someone. So a chalice, usually it represents like kind of a wine cup with like, you know, maybe stones set in it or something like that. Okay, the next one is bow. And we've seen the word bow before in There Will Come Soft Rains. Bow represents a large branch or a tree. In this poem, we have the bird having to sit on a perch inside of a cage when it really longs to be free, landing in the trees, landing on the branches of the trees. And then four, we have the word carol. And we've heard the word carol before, and it represents a, a song, a religious song or a popular hymn. It usually has to do with like joy or praise or emotion. So we hear like Christmas carols a lot. So that, that word is used where the bird is singing its song, but the author tells us it's not a carol. It's not a song of joy. It is instead this song of prayer, asking for something, this asking for the freedom it can't quite attain. And that is it for this particular poem. I'm going to put this on Ed Puzzle, and you're going to watch it there. And don't forget to do the notes as you're going through this. And don't forget there will be quizzes on all three of these poems. If you want to look ahead on the slideshow, you can see the date of those. And I will talk to you again later.